Welcome to Discovering. It's the beginning of a new year, and that means it's time to transition from hunting back to fishing. We'll take a look at some of the ice fishing opportunities available here in the Upper Peninsula. So sit back, put your feet up and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan The ice fishing season is upon us. Walleyes, pike, bluegill, perch, trout, whitefish, jigging, tip-ups, spearing, pop-up tents, permanent shacks, dark houses, you name it, you can find it all across the Upper Peninsula. No matter where you live in the UP, you don't have to travel far to find a place to ice fish for one species or another. Hitting the ice on a small backwoods lake for panfish is a UP pastime that's hard to beat. That ain't too little. It's a bluegill. Two. Two. <laughs> That's why it wasn't too little. A lot of times when we fish in deeper water, it's tough to uh, get your line to go down, especially if you're not inside of the shack because the wind is blowing and that. So instead of putting a sinker above it, we put another jig above it to help weight it down. You put one jig on the bottom, one jig above it. And then uh, a, lot of, a lot of times when you're in the deeper water, they'll, uh, they'll bite your sinker. You know, and you'll be getting a lot of hits and you can't hook anything. It's because they're they're actually biting your sinker. They're not biting your line or your bait. So this way it eliminates that. Your sinker is another hook. It's a lot easier too. You have two different colors down there, two different setups. Uh, two different depths. Two different depths. Yeah, you're you're giving a little better presentation. You know, they sometimes they prefer one lure only. Sometimes they'll eat both. It depends how they're feeding for the day, but. Seems to make it a lot better than putting sinkers on and getting them hitting on your sinkers. That's a nice better one. one. Yeah. <laughs> getting any bites. Most of these fish are suspended four to five feet from the bottom and you're set up to fish normally. You know, most people's thinking is we're going to fish six or eight inches off the bottom. You do that, you're dropping past the fish and you're fishing below them. The only hope you have is when you're dropping down it one picks it up on the way down. With this you can see that fish, you know, where he is in the water column and then you uh, can target him directly where he's where he's at. You know, if he's 25 feet of water and the fish is 14 feet off the bottom, you can see it on here. You watch your lure go right down to the same level as your fish is at. Put a direct target on him that way, you know, I mean, and without that you're just fishing blind, you're guessing. It's a big difference in whether you're catching fish or just fishing for fish. You can see my jig when I'm moving it up and down like that, going up and down. That's a fish right there. And he's more in the center of the cone. You can tell by the color. If it's red, it's in fact, he's, your he's looking at it right now. If you come up to it, um, I chased him away. Must have hit him in the head. But depending on the color, if it's green, he's further away from the center of the cone that's in the water. As it turns orange, he's getting closer, and red is in the center of the cone. And that's kind of how you tell where that fish is in relation to your jig, because your jig is in the center of the cone too. There's a couple of them down there. Those lines are, are other fish down there. As long as it reads quickly, yep. you move your so you're line. at real time. Yeah, real you time. move your line, you need to see that line move. You know, when it goes up, you need to see it. If it's falling, you need to see it. And then you can see what that fish does, you know, according to what you do. If you're jigging too fast and he swims away, you need to slow down. If you slow down 
and they're interested, that's what the key is for the day. Otherwise, maybe more aggressive or taking it away from them. It's all a game. See this one coming? He's coming right at it. He's almost there. He should be biting. There he is. Just that easy. Oh, that's a good one too. Fun fish. That's a jumbo perch is all about. It'd be pretty hard to talk about perch fishing in the UP without mentioning Lake Googiebic. What the deal is that uh, they're staging, getting ready to spawn. So uh, we're targeting these transition areas um, off the steep breaks where it transitions into the mud. And these perch are down there feeding on the wigglers that are coming up out of the mud. Wiggler is the uh, mayfly that we see in the uh, during the open water season. But that's what these guys are uh, down there feeding on. Jumbo perch on Lake Gogebic. I got a dropper on here, so I have a weight above my jig, and uh, I'm watching my sonar unit here, and I'm, I'm dropping my jig down into that mud and, and shaking it up a little bit, just pounding it. You want to stir it up, and it causes a little commotion, that plume, you know, rising up off bottom there, and uh, bring it up. But this is a much more subtle presentation where I'm just, as you can see, I got kind of a, ultra, this is an ultralight rod. A noodle rod is probably even a better choice. I'm just kind of rolling it down there. I'm not. I'm not really jigging it, but I'm just rolling it, just keeping that that tip wiggling a little bit. Um, dead sticking. Um, I got another rod right next to me here that's uh, we call dead sticking, and it's just hanging there. And every once in a while, I'll uh, come over here and just just tap it a little bit like that, just to get a little movement out of it. And I can actually see both jigs down there with the Vexler in this hole. Now what you want for uh, perch fishing is, is either a super ultralight or a noodle rod. You want that flex in there like this. If you're not feeling the strike, you're, you're seeing it with your rod tip. So you want a really light, flexible rod tip. A lot of guys are putting spring bobbers on here and, and they will extend uh, off the tip of their rod there past the last eye and they're super sensitive so you'll see that just go down like that that's a nice fish but those big perch they're coming up after these uh after these spoons they're not really too intimidated although that last fish i caught i had one or two come in before that that came right up to it looked at it and went away so then i downsized to a smaller jig and it seemed to be the ticket that was probably about a 13 and a half inch perch female you know i i I set the hook on it, and, and I had my drag set kind of like, kind of light, so uh, as long as you're taking your time, bring that fish up relatively slow, uh, they're going to be fine to release. Look at that perch. Look at that perch. Oh my god. Look at that. That's what we get on Lake Gogebic. Oh. So I just dropped down to this smaller jig. I was using something a little bit more mammoth because of the size of these guys girls and this isn't even as big as they get so this one is actually in real good shape because I took my time with her she's just fine she didn't blow her stomach so uh, this is a good spawning female I'm gonna release this fish right down she goes Lake Gogebic is the Upper Peninsula's largest inland lake, so of course it's home to more than just jumbo perch. There we go. <laughs> a little on the small side, but uh, Gogebic walleye. This walleye, I don't know, he's probably around that 13, 13 and a half inch range, I'd guess, which is very common on Gogebic. Gogebic is a real walleye factory, so we're kind of known for numbers of fish. Not necessarily trophy class, not that we don't catch any uh, large fish, but the ranges between about 13 and 16 inches is the most common fish that you catch. One thing on Gogebic is that we got a new regulation in place now. You can still have five walleyes per day. Uh, two of those fish can be between 13 and 15 inches, and the other three still have to be over 15. 
so it allows the anglers to uh, still go home with a meal. So it's been real good. This is a number seven jigging Rapala. This is an orange and gold that we're using right now. We're using number six, six pound test line. And if I go up the line here a little bit, if you see this swivel in the line, this is always a good thing to do, especially when you're fishing with a jigging Rapala like this because these baits spin, they go in circles. Sucker minnows, and I'm just gonna hook them through the nose like that, and I'm gonna pinch it off here behind the gills like that. So you got some good fresh scent and uh, and bait down there as we're jigging that. There we go. Look at that. That's a beautiful looking walleye. Gogebic, they got such a beautiful golden color. They don't get uh, like the white or pale that they are in a lot of lakes. They get, keep that nice, most of the time, that deep gold color on them. It makes them so pretty. Just nailed it on that bottom treble. If we're jigging one rod, we'll uh, use a slip bobber setup, which is going to be uh, very similar to the same thing that we're doing with the tip-ups. Um, we're using a, about a number eight treble hook tied right to our monofilament. Just a little bit above that, we got our couple of split shots to keep it down there. Same method that we're using with the tip-up, except we're just fishing in the shack, so we're using a slip bobber, which slides up and down the line. There's a little bead between the uh, bobber and the stop. And of course, there's a knot that gets tied on the line here, so you can set the proper depth. And then the knot will just reel right up into your line, just like uh, summertime fishing. And then we're just hooking a sucker minnow on here. Hook the minnow just kind of back towards the back of the dorsal fin there, and we'll drop them down. Well, that one took her right down. You know, with Gugibic, with the number of walleyes that we, we catch out here, and uh, being able to catch and keep a couple of these fish that are between 13 and 15 inches. Uh, honestly, in my opinion, these are the best eaten fish that, that we got to, between this, this size. You know, they fry up just wonderful and uh, uh, they taste better. You know, a lot of people uh, maybe eat big fish and it's always great to catch a bigger one, but I'll tell you, these are gonna be the best tasting fish of the day. An estimated 20,000 dark house fishermen in Michigan who enjoy the sport of spearing. This historic form of angling has been practiced by diehard fishermen for over two centuries. It's as much a tradition as it is a sport. It's about 16 feet of water here and the fish that we're targeting here go out and suspend in the big lake and then they you know they'll feed out there and they'll come in here. You don't see herring and, and whitefish uh, in here and even smelt you don't see in here because it's too shallow so you know that's where they're where they're out uh, and then they'll they come back in and, and lay around until that's digested every big fish that is in the, the belly of the uh, the ones we spear are all taken in from the head and that's why when they'll come in and they'll hit the decoy uh, they'll injure it and then they'll come back in and they'll they'll grab it by the head and then and then suck it in the term dark house is because there's no windows in here you use a light that comes through the ice and the fish don't see you up here. For getting into spear fishing, you don't you don't have to have a you know a fancy wooden shack. As long as you got you know most of it's dark, as dark as you can, so you don't have any light behind you so the fish can see the movement because as soon as anything comes above them and, and moves it, they spook. I mean that's just their, their instinct. So that's all you need. And a spear, you know, any sport shop has them, but you want to get a spear that has good big barbs. A lot of the ones that you'll buy, they put them on a bandsaw, a metal bandsaw, and they'll just cut it in and then they'll pull that out. It doesn't hold the fish. You really have to sink your spear into that fish. And good spears are expensive, anywhere from $75 up to $300. This is a, this is a $300 spear right here. Your spear is, is as important to, to fishing or spearing as it is, you know, shotgun or, or rifle is to, to hunting. Look at two of them. Oh, that one, I, that one, I saw that one last week, with the screwed up tail on it. The, the decoys, you don't have to carve them. There's a lot of decoys, I, and they all work. 
Uh, they don't have to be wood and they, they don't have to be decorative. And even if you want to take a uh, red and white daredevil, take the, the hooks off or leave the hooks on and just jiggle it. Uh, there's a lot of decoys out there that guys make that are just a flat piece of wood. They've got different colors on it. It's, it's anything to get those fish to come in within the distance that you want to, so you can throw the spear and, and, and harvest. The other thing is you don't throw the spear. You put the head of the spear in the water first, and you just put it in there. Because if, if, you, if you splatch it in like that, before you release it, the fish is going to be gone. Hold your hand right here like this, and then push it. You, you just push it. And, and the other thing is that when you've got the head of your spear is below the water, there's no refraction. You lead it. And if you've got a fish coming in or going out, you want to you wanna throw at the at the head and the best place that you'll normally hit it is right at the base of the of the, the fish's skull. <laughs> About 32 I'd say. There. That's a good eating size right there. If northern pike's not on your menu, give whitefish a try. A pike will, will come in and they'll hit the, the decoy most of the time. But what the whitefish do is they just think it's another another whitefish and they'll come in and, and see if it is or if it isn't. They'll come in on the side. So most of your, your when you throw your spear, it's going to be on the side. So what I'm doing now is I, I'm, I'm putting the decoys, uh, one decoy out on either side of the shack. It's about five feet on either side of the shack. And lo and behold, it doesn't bother them. Maybe they think it's a school or what. They start coming in right underneath the, you know, the decoys. One scares them and, you know, multiple ones obviously don't, so. <coughs> Got him. I want this one to get off of it now. Oh, yeah. It looks about the same size. That's the smallest one I've got here. <sighs> that one is stuck. You'll see how they can how they can go out. Powerful there. When you're not seeing fish in the winter time, you don't really want to move around a whole lot. So you want to get a lure that has rattles in. So I'm using a buckshot rattle spoon and glow in the dark because of the tannic acid. You got visual, you got uh, rattles for sound and you're pounding the bottom. So they, they hear that, they feel it. And then when they glow in the dark, they can get a visual on it. But by the time they come over, they're excited because you've pounded the bottom so much you get the dust and muck off the bottom that's settled over the years to it just get a big cloud. People think that the cloud interferes with catching the fish. Well, the fish see that, they hear it, they coming over because they think fish are feeding off of something on the bottom. And they see all this dust that's like, wow, there is fish feeding on the bottom. And they rush into that dust looking for where the food is to get their fair share and, and they just grab whatever's there and that's your lure. Of course, a look at ice fishing in the UP wouldn't be complete without spending some time fishing for pike and walleye on one of the many bays of the Great Lakes. Nice. That's how we do it, look at that. Fish on, baby. <laughs> we'll let them eat her a little bit. Oh, is this a dandy? There we go. Yeah, 27 and a half. Fat little hog. Yeah. 
Got him? Yeah. Heavy? Oh, Jesus. That is not that big. Think I only cut something. We just missed the block 45 incher. Really? Broke that big. Here it comes. 20 feet. Put your hand in there, guy. Here we go. Let's see if we can. Oh, there we go Why again. Are you kidding me? <laughs> then let him put his head past that hole oh, one more no. inch than he was getting. Like uh, and about 40 and a half, yep. A little bait and knock. A little piece of God's country. <laughs> That's awesome. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> December 31st marked not only the end of the year, but also the end of deer season. I'll leave you with a look at one last buck, which happened to be this lucky hunter's first buck. So yeah, this is my first buck. And so last week we came out here and we were hunting and it was about dark and we saw this guy right here walk out. And then he was out there for like five minutes and then he kind of walked away and it was pretty dark so couldn't really get a good shot at him. So then this week we moved the blind a little closer and well we got out there like after the Michigan game <laughs> and then we came out fifth and we just sat in the blind and like for like 15 minutes and then out walked this eight pointer right here. I grabbed the gun and he must have heard me so he started running away but then he stopped right in front of the blind and had a good shot at him and pulled back the hammer and fired and he dropped right there. So when we shot it, we had this rig we made and we used an old crutch. We put the gun and we leaned it on like where you put the hand. It helped me keep the gun steady. Nice eight pointer. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.